Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part three of our talk on hematuria. In the last session, we spoke about a number of things, polynephritis, including some unusual infections like XGP. We talked about emphyseminous polynephritis. We mentioned tuberculosis, and then we spoke about renal infarction as a cause of hematuria and the various appearances of renal infarct. Let's pick it up away from the artery and go to the vein. Renal vein thrombosis, or the presence of thrombus in the major renal veins or its tributaries, is far less common than one would uh, expect. It's more common in men than women, and the clinical manifestations will vary by the rapid nature or the lack of rapid nature of the venous occlusion. The most common etiology is typically nephrotic syndrome, though almost any hypercoagulability disorder can do it. Malignant tumors of can, of course, one of the things we do when we look at renal cell carcinoma or even TCC is look for extension of tumor into the renal vein, and of course, we follow it to the IVC. Also, infection, trauma, or as a post-renal transplant complication are all possibilities. When you look at the renal vein thrombosis differential diagnosis, you can see it goes pretty extensive. Transplants, vasculitis, sickle cell lupus, amyloid, diabetic nephropathy, on and on. So again, there's a number of different things we can think about. Clinical history is important, but the imaging findings is really what is typically the, our ability to make the correct diagnosis. CT is the imaging study of choice for diagnosing renal vein thrombosis. It's fast, it's non-invasive, and articles have shown high sensitivity and high specificity, both in detecting the presence of thrombus, but also in defining specifically its cause. Here's a nice example. One of the things you typically see with renal vein thrombosis, though not only with renal vein thrombosis, is persistent cortical medullary differentiation as you can see here in the left kidney. You also will see stranding around the kidney. Then when you look carefully, you'll also see the presence of thrombus. It can be seen in the arterial phase and in tumors when there's thrombus and it's a clear cell and there's involvement of the renal vein, you may see increased vascularity in the renal vein, but that's typically with tumor. Essentially, every other cause of renal thrombosis, uh, renal vein thrombosis that is, is gonna be hypodense. And when you look at this case, you can see it really nicely. There's no near total occlusion of the left renal vein. There's some flow around the edges. The coronal view is particularly helpful, I find, because you bring the renal vein into perfect perspective. On the axial view, it's often partial average on multiple slices. I can just get it right on either a pure coronal or a coronal oblique, and you see it very nicely here. You'll also want to look carefully. You can see the left adrenal vein and left gonadal vein. They can be involved with extension by thrombus, but that's not the case here. Again, just a really nice example of that renal vein thrombosis going near, but not into the patient's IVC. Here is again a few more images of that case. Again, the slight differential enhancement between the left and right kidney, and a really nice look at the patient's renal vein thrombosis. And this is one of my favorite examples because, you know, what you're seeing is really how extensive the process is. This patient presented with early symptoms, which is why the kidney still functions so normally with just minimal changes because it's really early in the process. If you don't make the diagnosis early, then you start getting all sorts of problems. Here is another patient with renal vein thrombosis. Again, that same type of appearance. You see the vessels dilated. There's thrombus. There's some peripheral enhancement. Another example, very similar here. It only goes near the midline of the left renal vein. Again, the left kidney is small compared to the right, but um, you're not really seeing much cortical medullary difference. Here it is very nicely shown on the coronal view, and you see the thrombus and some of the branching of the renal vein and thrombus extending into those branches, all very nicely shown in this example. Another case, renal vein thrombosis, non-occlusive. This patient had a prior right nephrectomy. We tried to figure out why this patient had renal vein thrombosis. This was not tumor. This patient was treated with anticoagulant therapy and the renal vein thrombosis um, resolved. 
We somehow think it was related to the uh, patient's surgery to the right kidney with the right nephrectomy. Now, we mentioned before one of the challenges about non-contrast CT is you don't see the vessels, and so things arterial, I mentioned AV fistula, aneurysms, but also renal vein thrombosis. Patient with hematuria, you don't see anything really, maybe there's a slight difference in the amount of fat in the hilum with less fat in the right than the left hilum. We look at the kidneys, that same appearance is really there, but again, non-contrast, it's hard to make much out of it. But here, when you give contrast, you see what's a beautiful example of a renal AV malformation. So vascular processes are not that common, but they do occur. We've seen complications by not recognizing them. And again, when you give contrast, you're gonna see the findings. So again, very important to have contrast. Here's just a few images, again, showing you that AV malformation near the inferior aspect of the right renal hilum and the right lower pole of the kidney. Even in retrospect, okay, you wanna argue there's some fullness in the kidney here, but nobody read that, times three. And here it is, very nicely shown. And here it is, MIP imaging. I love MIP imaging with any vascular process. Again, spatial relationships aren't shown well, but the vasculature is shown well. So the AV fistula, very nicely defined. Now this article by Cara Fellow is a case report. Renal AV malformations are rare lesions, may be acquired or congenital. Acquired are relatively rare, accounting for less than 5% of all renal AVMs. Hematuria is the major and most common symptom. Other clinical manifestations such as hypertension, cardiac failure, abdominal pain can also be involved. Here's a wonderful case. You look at the non-contrast here and you say, well, why is the renal veins so large bilaterally? Again, why are they so large? Well, that's the late phase imaging. I'm not sure, you look, it kind of looks funny. I mean, these are large fullness in the hilum. What exactly are we dealing with? Well, obviously, if I give you the correct phase, you'll know the answer a bit better. But look at the 3D maps on the late phase. It almost looks like masses in the renal hilum bilaterally. Could this patient have some strange tumor and have renal vein involvement? No. When you get the images on the early face, look at the size of the renal veins. This is AV shunting bilaterally. Artery and veins in the early phase imaging. Beautifully shown on the uh, coronal view. This is a volume rendered to accentuate the uh, early drainage into the IVC. The dilated renal veins bilaterally on this color-coded volume rendering. Beautiful example, again, with the cinematic of renal AV malformation, and this was bilateral. So one of the things, you can get some unusual appearances. This is probably my favorite unusual appearance. Huge bilateral renal veins throughout their course, draining early into the IVC. The arterial structures look normal, but then you could see the patient's collateral vessels here and the patient's AV malformation. So just a really beautiful example of AV malformation. Just a really nice case. Now, again, look at this patient. You see that AV malformation in the right kidney, very nicely shown. Here it is as you go to the coronal views, large, prominent venous structures, dilated arterial structures, the venous structures are filling on the early phase imaging. Just a beautiful example of a right renal AV malformation. Another case, patient with hematuria. Nothing very obvious in the kidneys on the axial or coronal non-contrast scans. And then you keep going and you say, well, what's going on here exactly? What exactly is happening? You look at the arterial phase, you see a big spleen, you look at the venous phase, at first glance, the only thing that impresses you, perhaps, is the compression of the left kidney by the spleen. But then you look a little bit more carefully. You start looking at the calyces. And what exactly are you dealing with? Well, this is not a vascular malformation like the other cases. But why are the calyces looking so unusual? Look at the calyces here, okay? 
Now this is in a sense some sort of vasculitis, but it's in the calyces, it's in the tip of the calyces, whether you talk about the cup sign or various signs, this is a beautiful example of papillary necrosis in a patient with sickle cell disease. Now papillary necrosis is a vascular process, but it's really of the small vessels and the way you see papillary necrosis is on the excretory phase imaging. So I wanted to connect the arterial abnormalities I showed you, the venous abnormalities, as well as papillary necrosis. Papillary necrosis is one of the things you can see with a number of etiologies, but especially sickle cell disease. Patients with sickle cell can get segmental infarction and papillary necrosis. You can get bleeds with perirenal hematomas. It's estimated that renal papillary necrosis affects up to 50% of individuals with sickle cell disease. Papillary necrosis is optimally depicted on excretory phase CT as calyceal blunting or excreted contrast enveloping necrotic sloth papilla, which is called the golf ball on T sign. Now, one of the things about papillary necrosis, and one of the reasons I think it's missed a lot, is because, uh, we've made this point before, if you do delayed phase imaging and it's more than five minutes, the contrast is very dense and you have beam hardening, so it's hard to see the edges of the calyces. If you go four to five minutes and you widen the windows, and you use MIP imaging, the changes of papillary necrosis are better seen. So just some facts about papillary necrosis. The renal medulla and papillary are vulnerable to ischemic necrosis because of their unique arrangement of their blood supply and the local interstitial hypertonicity. Risk factors, we mentioned sickle cell, but diabetes, analgesic abuse, high dose non-steroidal inflammatory disease, chronic infection, and even things like renal vein thrombosis can all be tied together. You have compromised perfusion, you can have spasm, compression, vasculitis, and again, it varies greatly in terms of severity and in rate of progression. This is an article from Subtomi Kawamoto showing you very nicely these drawings of normal calyces, the medullary type and papillary types of papillary necrosis, and you can see calyceal blunting. In the um, papillary type, uh, you can see the entire papilla may become necrotic. So that's one of the classic things. We talk about this lobster claw appearance. One of the things of papillary necrosis, it can be reversible if treated early. Necrosis and sloughing a papilla into the pelvic system can occur. You can have contrast material filled papillary cavities and blunting of the calyces. So there's a range of appearances, this lobster claw sign with papillary and the ball on T appearance people talk about with the medullary type. And here's just a very nice example of a patient with microscopic hematuria. If you look at the uppermost images, you just look and don't really see much. But when you widen the windows, then you see the changes of papillary necrosis. You see that ball on T appearance. And then when you do the MIP imaging, it's much easier to see here and see here and see here as well. So again, um, a very, very important finding, very easy to recognize. Now, with papillary necrosis, we mentioned sloth papilla. Here's a very nice example of a sloth papilla. Really, really easy to see. You can see it best on the MIP imaging, the destruction of the papilla, really, really nicely shown. Okay, a really nice example. Now, in the last part of looking at um, hematuria, we also need to think beyond the kidney. And thinking beyond the kidney takes me to the bladder. So let's just discuss a little bit of bladder cancer and then let's take a short break. Now, bladder cancer, we talk about lots of cases in the US, over 70,000 cases. Most are transitional cell, others are squamous, others are adenocarcinoma, particularly as related to uracal carcinoma. The sensitivity for CT for detecting bladder cancer is very high. We use lots of CT scans to stage bladder cancer. We detect bladder cancer when it's suspected or unsuspected. One of the things we spoke about in the incidental findings lecture is that bladder cancer can be a very small lesion that you pick it up when you're doing a CTA of the aorta. 
We talk about the fact that bladder cancers are typically older patients, the same patients who have lots of vascular disease, the same patients who we evaluated with CT of the aorta. Now, bladder cancer often stands out better on the arterial face imaging when the, there is no urine in the bladder. But most of these cases will be shown both on the early and late phase imaging. And here's just a good example of a large mass in the bladder. And then you could see it on the late phase when there's contrast excretion. Now, obviously, this is a larger tumor, so it's no great surprise. But even smaller tumors can be shown on both phases. I do think, particularly when a lesion is posterior in the bladder, it's easier to see on the early phase because on the later phase, sometimes you get fooled by compression by the prostate or the way the bladder is sitting, and you tend to overlook the lesion. Again, things like coronal or 3D imaging, as in this case, shows it very nicely and the relationship to the patient's ureter. So let's do this. Let's stop right here and pick the story up about the bladder, and that'll be part four and our final part of the study. Okay, thanks very much. See you in a bit. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.